Next, from Springfield, SIU President Glenn Pichard talks with us about the economic disparity among students going to college and why a school like Southern Illinois University has a different mission than many of the schools from wealthy regions of the state. This runs about 25 minutes. President Glenn Pichard, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. Thanks for having me, Terry. Uh, just recently we heard, and so congratulations to you, that uh, Southern Illinois University had, I think, a, a huge spike in freshmen coming into your school. And so we did have like some good news. Mm -hmm. uh, two years in a row now, we've had a large freshman class, which I think bodes well for us in the future because we've been down in enrollment a little bit, but then all of the public universities in the state uh, have uh, been going through enrollment dec decline slightly. And um, this is good news for us because we're having some smaller classes at our junior and senior level that are graduating. And uh, the freshman classes are, uh, are beginning to rise again. So we think that that looks well for the future for us. And as you mentioned, you know, I, and I was just talking the other day to someone in higher education, they were saying, as you just indicated, that uh, enrollment is down. I asked why that was. They said, you know, they're uh, at different schools starting to hit the wall as far as how much yes. more they can pass along as far as tuition. Yes. Increases. Yes. And because of the state's finances, A, they've been late in paying you, B, uh, putting more money into the pensions. Yes. Schools across the state have had to raise tuitions. Yes. I know you're very concerned about that, and, and part of what we wanted to talk about was you, you just recently gave a speech called The Two Illinois. Um, mm -hmm. For those who didn't hear the speech, we <laughs> carried it, but you delivered it at the City Club of Chicago. Sure. Tell us what you mean about The Two Illinois, and to what extent does the state's current fiscal problems uh, exacerbate the, uh, the differences in income as we see it in the different regions? Well, the Illinois Board of Higher Education put out uh, about five years ago now what they call the public agenda. And they looked at the state and uh, uh, took all the data that they gathered from their research and so on, and they in fact labeled Illinois as two Illinois. Primarily the suburban area around Chicago, most of the collar counties there, uh, with the exception of, uh, uh, of the southern part of the city of Chicago. All of that area they labeled as one Illinois. It's prosperous, has high education, uh, uh, higher education institutions all over the place. People are more well educated uh, and, and the economy is good. People uh, make on the average of $60,000 a year in those regions. But there's another Illinois, and, the, and that is primarily the southernmost end of the state, as well as those pockets in the south side of Chicago and other areas. And in that Illinois, uh, uh, it is not prosperous. Uh, there, the educational uh, systems are not as good as they are in, in the other Illinois. There's just a plethora of things that economically, educationally, socially, socially uh, uh, affect the overall quality of life in those areas. And education is certainly one of them. Our university, while we are like any other university in that we do our best to recruit uh, students from the best high schools uh, all over the state and our standards have been rising over the years. We still are located in one of those areas of the other Illinois as, as uh, IBHE uh, describes it. And uh, we, 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 we consider ourselves a university of opportunity in that we want to keep the doors open to good kids that graduate from that other Illinois that is not as prosperous, not as educationally sound, and so on. And, uh, and so our university has a double mission, so to speak, of making sure that we keep the doors open for kids who may not have the highest ACT scores, may not have come from schools that have the best quality or communities that are economically sound. Uh, and, and that becomes an important part of our mission as well. They're good kids, they're academically qualified, but they don't have the economic wherewithal to really come to a major public university. And especially in the crisis, 
that the state has endured financially over the past several years, where they have cut higher education uh, <clears throat> about as much as any agency in the state, uh, then we still have to find a way to provide to help those students from those low-income families to come through the doors of our university. Uh, because we, SIU, for instance, has received uh, an annual $45 million decrease in where we were t even 10 years ago with the state. Well, that's a lot of money. And what, what is your overall budget? <clears throat> I mean, so uh, on a percentage basis, what kind of a cut is that? Well, uh, thankfully this year they decided to hold us level funding, but in previous years it was about 6% a year. And that's been going on for a long time. And so our, uh, our overall state appropriation uh, has gone from $248 million in 2002 to $203 million this year. It's about a $45 million annual decline now. That's a lot of money. And that means uh, we've got to raise uh, tuition, we've got to raise fees to compensate for the loss of those state funds. Thankfully, we've kept and I, it. And I think you also mentioned in an appropriation committee hearing. Yes. Don't you have something like 500 positions that you haven't filled? That's correct. Um, the only way for us to balance our budget, which we're required by law to do, um, is to cut expenses uh, or to raise revenues. Well, the only revenue stream we have are the tuition and fees that come from the students. And if the state is declining in their share of that revenue stream, then you have to make it up somewhere. So the only way you can make it up since 76% of our budget has to do with personnel. Um, the only way you can make it up is not to fill positions. And as we have had people leave for retirement and other purposes, we have not filled over 500 positions in our system. Um, Which obviously I must, yeah, I don't think it was that you were extremely bloated, I guess, it's, but it no. probably put some strain on the human infrastructure and that other people have to pick up that slack uh, exactly. of positions. No question about it. And we have undergone uh, every efficiency operation that we can uh, to make sure that uh, where classes are not producing a number of students, the, those classes may be combined with other classes or uh, may be eliminated altogether. We've cut back on travel for our people. As I said, we've not filled positions as they have left the university. So we've done everything we can to make sure that we keep our fiscal house in order, which we've done. And we've gotten very good reports from Bain and from uh, Moody's and, and Standard and & Poor's and others, um, rating agencies. But still yet, the stress that you feel from the loss of that income and then putting it on the backs of middle and low income families to be able to afford it themselves without any help from the government is really tough. We, we have tried to expand our scholarship opportunities, our, our uh, student needs uh, programs and so on, but we've taken it from both sides. The federal sequester is cutting back on funds for needy students. It's also cutting back on research funds that we need for our research part of our university. So at the federal level, we've had that. At the state level, we've seen the MAP funds, the Monetary Assistance Program for needy students, uh, take a dive in that <clears throat> they're only funding about half of the kids that are eligible for that program now. So if we can't make it up some way in tuition or fees, then we just, uh, we just lose the quality and everything else that's associated with our university, and we're not going to do that. You know, I, not for me to make the arguments for you, but I, <clears throat> part of the Illinois Channel is we want to focus. I think sometimes we, as a citizenry, don't always grasp the importance of certain things happening. So yes. We're trying to shine a light on some of those issues. Sure. Two-thirds of the population of Illinois lives in the Chicagoland area. Yes. They are not as dependent economically on any one institution. They have so many no. other businesses. The economy is gross, uh, very diverse. Right. A lot of those people may send their kids to colleges out of state. Exactly. But we were just talking with the community colleges, and they yes. were saying how many times, whether it's Ren Lake College in Worthington mm -hmm. there, 
wherever uh, John Wood, uh, they are mm -hmm. an economic engine in a relatively small community. Yes. They're the meeting place. That's it's, right. Uh, they're the major employer. Yes. And certainly Southern Illinois University, uh, right. with campuses both at Edwardsville uh, and uh, obviously the main campus on Carbondale. Yes. I think people and maybe in the Chicagoland area don't appreciate the fact of how much of an economic pillar you are for that region of the state. Exactly. So when you don't have 500 people, uh, you don't have those 500 salaries to pay, right. you don't have 500 people who are spending dollars at local cinemas and restaurants That's and exactly car right. and that ripples throughout the economy. Uh, you know, I just just to point that out, we hear and yeah. say, "Well, you got to suck it up," but it's not just the economic impact of Southern right. Illinois University, but on the region. It is, uh, Terry. We we influence the whole Southern Illinois region. Uh, uh, the community colleges, each one of them, have an effect on maybe two or three or four counties. But our university, people take home eleven thousand paychecks a month from Southern Illinois University. And that's a lot of jobs for an area that has traditionally been economically depleted. And uh, the, you know, the mission of the university is not just to economically affect the university in the way of our paychecks and that sort of thing, but we, we buy 400 million to 500 million dollars of goods and services a year on the local economy from local merchants. Uh, if the state's paying us six months late and they're cutting our funds 45 million a year, you know, then those folks have to uh, wait until we're able to pay them in a timely fashion. And that puts a strain on their business. So because we are the largest economic engine in that part of the state, when the state can't pay its bills on time to us, or our reimbursements on time, uh, uh, we, we have a terrific problem that reverberates throughout our entire economy. I'm going to go back to, uh, I believe it was when you were testifying on before the Appropriations Committee. Yes. Probably in May. Uh, as I recall the numbers, which were shocking to me at the time to mm -hmm. hear you testify that, something like 75% of your budget Mm -hmm. uh, in that that fiscal year had not yet been paid by the state. That's correct. Uh, and here there were only two months left in the state. I mean, imagine yes. for those who are, if somebody <laughs> was getting uh, $50,000 a year from their employer, but with two months left in the year, they hadn't been paid 75% of their salary. That's exactly. somewhat like you do. How, how in that context does one manage? I mean, we, I guess we somewhat touched on sure. it. You didn't fill 500 positions right. and all, and you raised right. tuitions. Yes. Have you, so... Are you keeping your head above water with those steps? And number number two, let's go back to your students are often the students that maybe are the first people in their uh, families to have ever gone to college. That's correct. Uh, they are taking that first rung on the on the ladder, so to speak, of changing the economic history of their family. Yes. So I know that's a major concern of yours and where your uh, student population is going to be. Uh, more financially sensitive than yes. say, someone going to Northwestern University. Exactly. So uh, how do you balance those two needs? On one hand, you need to keep your budget going, and on the other hand, you're very attuned to the fact that you're dealing with those who don't have very deep pockets and can least right. afford uh, the salary tuition. Right. Have you found a, a, a proper balance, or is it a day-by-day? -day, uh... No, I, I think we have a, a, a good balance in the way that we handle it. Uh, what we've tried to do uh, because of the loss of state funds, uh, we've tried to also enhance our uh, private giving. <clears throat> our foundation provides a lot of scholarships for our university, for our students, in, in this instance especially when the economy has been in the tank the way it has. So if you keep tuition low, if you provide the kind of services, especially at the freshman level, to help students uh, be retained so that they don't uh, uh, fail in those beginning uh, ventures when they need more mentoring and that sort of thing. Um, and, and if you, you try to get more private giving in to build on scholarships for the students and that sort of thing, along with the other economies of scale that we've put into place, then I think we found the balance. We, as I said, one would look at us and think that um, maybe 
your bond ratings and everything would be sinking to the lowest level. Even with the state's bond ratings going the way they've gone, we've maintained uh, a, a level, at least at the state level, or higher in our bond rating agencies' assessments of our financial condition. And I think we've done that through good fiscal management. I, I, you know, we, we don't spend things that we don't have money to spend for. I mean, we just don't spend it. Well, and, and as we started off, and your credit, you, you've just had a, a good influx of state, uh, or a freshman class. So, yes. Uh, you're you're yes. enrolling new students. We've invested in marketing. Uh, because we are a state university and we market all over the state because we recruit students from all over the state. Um, but we can't compete, for instance, with the major private institutions who have large billion dollar endowments such as Northwestern or Sh University of Chicago or, or a, a public university such as University of Illinois. Uh, so, so we have to find ways to help those middle and low income families that we do service better able to afford you know, the, uh, the, the education for their children, which we strive valiantly to do all the time. Let's talk just a bit. One thing that has come up, which since the last time we spoke, uh, has the is the whole thing of fracking the uh, legislature yes. passed a bill so we're now uh, it, it's interesting no one really knows but this could possibly be a, a game changer as we say for the economy of southern Illinois which on one hand had been somewhat decimated by the decline of the coal industry which yes. has been historically one of the major employers yes We've seen what uh, those who followed fracking has, have done in uh, western Pennsylvania and North Dakota. It's transformed yes. A, the local economies up there, created all kinds of great paying jobs. Right. What, what can you tell us about, what, what are your thoughts on the fracking and uh, what you're hearing and what your hopes are for what it might have on the region? And, and just to remind the viewers, you were also the congressman yes. uh, in years past, so you've you're very familiar with the issues from yeah. a historical context for the entire southern Illinois area. I am, and, and uh, in a sense, uh, Terry, this issue goes way back to uh, a point when I was still a child. Uh, just give you a little personal history here that, uh, that uh, my family was involved in. Um, back in the 1940s, long 1946-47, at the end of World War II, a major oil corporation in this country came in to talk to my grandfather who owned 120 acres of red clay in southeastern Illinois. Uh, he had about seven or eight children and uh, they told him that they wanted to go in and run some drill stem tests on the property to just see if there might be some oil there. Um, they did that. They went in and they spent a couple of weeks doing some drilling uh, tests and then came back out and told my grandfather that, well, there's nothing there. He didn't find anything. Um, but because uh, they had torn up a couple fences and had to build a road into the property to get their machinery in and so on, they just take the royalty of the 120 acres off his hands for $2,000. So my grandfather, being a poor farmer, uh, not having much education at all, gave it to him. They came in and proceeded to hit over 30 oil wells in a row without a dry hole. Some of those wells making 400 to 500 barrel of oil a day. And today, several of those oil wells are still pumping. Now that was in 1946, okay? My grandfather never saw a penny of that. His grand, his kids, his grandkids, his great grandkids, no one. I, the little house in which I was born and raised in southern Illinois, in this very area where fracking now is taking place, I could stand on my porch and see seven different flares from seven different oil wells within a hundred yards of our house. You know, it was the richest oil find in the history of Illinois. That's the area in which this is being promoted today because the wells that were drilled on my granddad's, granddad's farm did not go down into the shale. Well, <clears throat> so you could think that there'd be a little bit of concern about people from my area who generations ago lost everything in what was, I think, very unethical practices on the part of big oil companies. I've looked at this legislation very closely 
And thanks to Senator Fryerich, Representative Bradley, and, and uh, others who worked on it, Representative Phelps. I think it has a strong environmental component. Uh, I'm hopeful that none of the practices that were exacted on poor people, you know, 50 years ago would ever be allowed today. But as a native of that area, as a state senator and a congressman that's represented every one of the counties in this fracking area, I'm going to be keeping a close eye on what goes on with these companies who come in and how their transactions are, are taken care of with the locals in that area. I'm praying it does create a lot of jobs, but that's a very pristine, beautiful area. 265,000 acres of the Shawnee National Forest and a lot of that forest will be available to fracking. You're not going to replace the beautiful lakes, the waterfalls, you know, the wilderness areas and the other things in the Shawnee that are there for posterity if this thing goes wrong. I think they've done a great job in constructing the bill, but I think it's going to take a lot of local oversight too to make sure that the land and the pristine nature of the land is, is not going to be destroyed. And the Department of Natural Resources are certainly going to hear from a lot of people in that area if they let this thing go awry. I'm grateful for the potential jobs that can be created. God knows some of those counties are 11, 12, 13, 14 percent unemployment. They need the jobs. But uh, it's a very sensitive issue also. And uh, all of us, I think, have to watch it very closely. And before we go, how are these Salukis doing this year? <laughs> well, you know, we, we uh, beat the number four and the number seven team in the nation uh, on their uh, fields uh, two and three weeks ago. And this week, we lost to the number one team in the nation. They came in for our homecoming day and pretty much... Who planned uh, that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we've had, a, we've had a lot of success, and we've got a good team, and we think there's a good possibility that we can win out uh, the rest of the way now. So hopefully we'll make the playoffs. And the basketball team is looking up. Uh, Coach Henson just had his media day a couple days ago, and he's brought in some uh, height this year that we didn't have in the past. And we fully expect those guys to compete for some conference championships also. Well, we wish you well in sports and, and uh, <laughs> hopefully, too, the economy of Southern Illinois as well as the economy for the state turns around. Thank and you, we'll Terry. Visit with you again in the future and get a follow-up. But uh, congratulations again on successfully managing through this crisis. Hopefully it all Thank comes you. to a quick end. Thank you, sir. Thank I appreciate you. it. You're watching the Illinois Channel an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.